Hello and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for coming out today on this sunny Saturday for our very first in-person artist conversation and opening day talk of 2021. My name is Aisha Mazumdar Stanger and I work in public programs here at the Walker. Today's program is a celebration of the opening of solo exhibition by Rayon Tibet, who will be in conversation with curator Victoria Sung. If you're familiar with this area of the Walker, you may notice something a bit different about the windows next to us. Um, Rayan is responsible for this change in the window tint, and today you'll understand the choice behind this as it relates to the exhibition inside. Trained as both an architect and a sculptor, Beirut-based artist Rayan Tibet, for his first commission at a US museum, he has created a new installation focused on the intersections of architecture, design, and technology. We are so pleased to have him here. Please help me welcome Victoria Sun and Ryan Tibet. Thank you, Aisha. And thank you all for being here and braving the heat. I know it's been a very hot week in Minnesota. Um, and before we start, I just want to say, Ryan, it's been such a pleasure to have you here um, installing during this past week. Um, and thanks to you for braving the, the 99 degree weather as well. Um, so I know these conversations can zip by really quickly, um, but we have about 30 to 40 minutes um, where Ryan and I will uh, try to unpack this installation that's indoors. And then we'll open it up to um, all of you for Q&A for 10 to 15 minutes. So um, I think I'll just jump right in. So um, Ryan and Aisha gave a really wonderful uh, introduction to your practice um, as an artist. And one thing we've been talking about a lot is also you know, the storytelling um, that's so integral to your practice and telling stories in space using objects and sculpture and architecture. Can you, um, let's start with you maybe talking about how you happened upon this particular story um, that we see in the exhibition. And for those of you who haven't yet had a chance to um, go inside the galleries and see the exhibition, we encourage you to after the talk um, and we'll be in the galleries as well. Yeah, well, thanks everybody for for being here and for thank you victoria for the invitation and for braving alongside william this two-year um, process um so this project started with i mean shortly after you kind of invited me to maybe think of doing something uh here at the walker i was uh, sitting at my desk in san francisco having a cup of coffee when I dropped my coffee on the floor. And as I was cleaning the, uh, the floor next to my desk, I had to clean the underside of my chair I was sitting on. And then I noticed something I had never noticed before, that there was a sticker on my chair that says property of IBM. And I was like, what is, what is this thing doing here? And so I called my partner who happened to be in Dubai at the time and I asked her, what is this IBM chair doing in, in, our, in our house? And she said, well, when I was in, in a curatorial intern at the Walker in the 90s, I bought this Eames chair for $2 from Goodwill. And um, that's the extent of, of my knowledge of that. And so I just Googled IBM Minneapolis and then you know, the floodgates of hell opened. Um, I kind of fell into the story of um, the largest uh, IBM manufacturing plant uh, that was built in the late 50s by architect Eero Sarinen in, in Rochester, Minnesota. And um, uh, kind of fell into, you know, having been trained originally as, as an architect, I was, um, you know, I always felt like kind of I came of age in the kind of legacy of kind of mid-century modern design, but also kind of this shift from the industrial to the post-industrial kind of landscape. But I had never been kind of taught this this particular building, which now that I dove in, in its history, understood its importance in the formation of corporate architecture in the US. And by extension, our understanding of of um, office labor. Uh, and the reason behind that is 
was particularly um, uh, Thomas Watson Jr. hiring um, Eero Sarinen, the architect, Charles and Ray Eames, the industrial designers, and Paul Rand, the graphic designer, in the late 50s to reimagine the identity of IBM. And that kind of conjuring of these kind of uh, designers um, actually led to a complete reimagination of what the workforce could be, of this kind of s s seamless relationship between work life, office life, and home life with these very specific kind of uh, 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 furnitures. Um, uh, and then I, I felt that it could be, it would be interesting to maybe dive into this history to actually ultimately explore the moment that we find ourselves in today, which is actually the move from post-industrial to a complete dematerialization of, um, of the workforce and of labor. And as you know, a company like IBM is trying to reinvent itself today from moving from manufacturing to actually investing in um, digital security and artificial intelligence. I was really interested in kind of maybe taking this opportunity with this invitation to kind of dig deep into what, you know, and specifically for me, who's trained as like a, a sculptor and a maker of object, could I, you know, could I investigate this shift from object making to environment building to almost kind of like a meta, enter a metaphysical, metaphysical space? Great. So there's so much in there that I want to unpack. Um, just to begin with, so I mean, this notion of the story, you know, you tell this, you told this beautiful story about how it was very happenstance. And, you know, it was a chair that you owned happened to come from this, you know, IBM building that was once, as you said, the largest, you know, manufacturing facility uh, for the company in the United States. Can you talk a little bit more about your process of storytelling? And, you know, we've had a number of conversations where you put it really beautifully about, be, given your, you know, background in architecture, um, how you like to come in through the cracks of an architecture or find the cracks in architectural history. Can you expand upon that a little bit more um, in the context of this exhibition? Yeah, well, so, I mean, it's interesting because even though the the project is very much rooted in let's say research you know that kind of i i i dove deep into these uh, because kind of the research led me to these very specific elements like the facade of the of the rochester building the a very specific um uh, chair designed by Charles and Ray Eames that was used all over the office building and a, a ten, uh, ver 10 very specific shades of blue that Paul Rand had set uh, to be the you know lead graphic identity of the of the company, I I knew that those were kind of let's say the elements of the project, uh, but then I kind of went on a on like a kind of fact finding mission to come across in a way anecdotes that would kind of infiltrate those um, elements that not only are very set, but they're associated with figures that are also quite let's say, iconic figures, right? That kind of come come to us, are written about art historically and within the context of architectural and, and design legacies in a very, let's say, monumental, immovable um, um, way. And so in order to kind of confront, uh, confront that, I had to kind of go on, um, yeah, this kind of, to, to find, uh, like I always say, like a crack that I could kind of enter. Uh, one, one very important one was the fact that even though this building was such an important architectural feat, uh, quite practically in 2018, it was actually sold. Uh, and it's in the process of actually being dismantled. So even though we have this kind of association and almost fetish fet fetishistic relationship with mid-century modern design, this particular example is exactly the opposite of a lot of uh, examples like the Miller House or like the the St. Louis Arch, where kind of the logic of that of of uh, that the logic of those buildings is their preservation, whereas the logic of this building is actually it's almost uselessness. That you know this building no longer serves a, a real purpose for the company. So in a way, it could be taken apart, and so that it doesn't enter art history or the legacy of uh, architectural, um, uh, you know psyche the same way other things 
enter. And so in a way, I found in this building an opportunity that I could enact something on it. Similarly, with the, um, the chairs, I ended up finding this furniture dealer in Indianapolis that had bought uh, the leftover of these Eames chair parts because, you know, when the company started selling off their material, the complete chairs were kind of bought by like higher bidders that kind of then resold them in, you know, kind of, you know, uh, for you know, people's homes, because now everybody needs to have an Eames chair in their home. But this kind of furniture dealer in Indianapolis ended up with just like a bunch of legs and some shells. And I just, but they still came in from that place. They still had that kind of uh, authenticity to them. And so I was like, okay, can I just buy their entire stock and do something with it? Um, then suddenly, like I think something happened in the project where things that were all like anecdotes that were maybe a little bit more surreal started to happen. Like I came across the story that at the inauguration of the building in the 50s, a time capsule was lowered into the ground in the entrance of the building and employees from IBM donated objects that were put in this time capsule that's supposed to be opened a hundred years from its inauguration, which is in 2058, right? With the idea that this company thought that it would still be there in 2058 and that, you know, we're not even halfway through that and it's already kind of almost going. So this idea, or the fact that, uh, you know, the shade of blue used by Paul Rand for the logo of IBM actually comes from a very specific color of the sky above Rochester, Minnesota. That there was something, you know, very, let's say, otherworldly in those decisions that come to us as very, let's say, pragmatic. Or the fact that, you know, seasonal affective disorder that hits a lot of people in the Midwest can be cured by exposing yourself to blue light or the fact that, you know, Prince has a song called Computer Blue, and he happens to be born the same year that this building is inaugurated. So suddenly kind of this fact-finding way of thinking about this project exited the um, strictness of its own logic. And, in, and it's precisely in those stories and anecdotes that I find what I call these cracks, you know, because those anecdotes have the possibility to open up your imagination as opposed to be thought of just as kind of facts. Right. And all of those uh, references that Ryan just mentioned from, um, you know, prints to, I mean, of course, much of the IBM history is embedded in the installation. If you get a chance to listen to the audio piece um, that Ryan recorded, all of these, you know, seemingly tenuous um, connections become very apparent in a very beautiful way. Um, one thing I want you to maybe talk about a little bit more. Um, so I, I love how you talk about these minor histories, and you, you know, you said you kind of go through the cracks to find maybe histories that have been overlooked or forgotten, and you kind of tease them out through the installation. Um, and what I find so interesting with this exhibition and much of your work is you look at you know larger events so let's say here you you know you talked very much about um, looking at this shift in industrial labor to post-industrial labor and that moment in time um, and much of the story is also tied to you know uh, events in World War II and different personal connections um, that IBM and you know Thomas Watson jr relationships that he formed during the war um, and what I love is that it's these larger histories, but what you're grabbing on is the personal history, the personal connections, and how it's really those personal connections that inform how we may think about things or how things may come to be. So um, can you talk a little bit about maybe what informed your decision to then bring you know, the IBM facade, this two-toned blue um, exterior that's become so identified with this building in Rochester and your decision to bring it here to the facade of the walker. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in a way, like kind of what you were saying that part of, you know, the my process is um, 
not only finding kind of these these minor histories, but being able to kind of act upon them and thinking that those that, that events that happen have, uh, let's say, formal and um, uh, kind of they, they leave behind leftovers, right? And it's kind of, could we imagine kind of a, a, a parallel history of the world from these kind of leftovers? Or can we reimagine a, a condition or, or a space that is, um, uh, in a way, is in reference to something very specific, but maybe generates a completely different experience? And so when, when we kind of did the site visit in, 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 in Rochester, I was really moved by the kind of the two-tone blue facade of, of that building. Uh, and, and kind of when I was on a site visit here, uh, I mean, there's the obvious connections between the Barnes, uh, uh, you know, Edward Barnes having also designed uh, an IBM, um, uh, head, the IBM headquarters in New York. So there's kind of that mirroring of these two. So I had kind of this like un, um, kind of uncanny maybe conversation between one architect and another. Uh, but I was also really interested in the Cargill Lounge itself as being a moment where uh, in the history of the walk, very specific history of the walker, it's the moment where the Herzog and the Moron building and the Barnes building kind of meet, right? And they meet in this kind of curtain wall facade. And the idea of the curtain wall, you know, comes specifically from these kind of office buildings. And so it was already in the DNA of of the, the, the building itself, uh, sorry, that the building itself holds uh, a reference to, 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 um, to a building even without knowing that it holds that reference. And then we did kind of this quick calculation and we figured out that this particular section of the building is almost identical in scale to the height of the Rochester building. And so there was kind of this desire of what would happen if we just do a very simple transposition, right? It's almost a literal moving of that facade onto this one uh, by just kind of doing it through uh, two uh, tone color of vinyl and then just see what it does to the building right like could um so so and and in that um almost simplistic process lies a lot of my interest in kind of um uh environment making you know that there's something in a setup that of course relies heavily on kind of research and and encounters and histories but ultimately it's just about you know you enter this this uh, you know you go up the stairs and you're suddenly in this kind of blue light that very slowly changes the way you ultimately look at the world right and and so that's yeah that's about this one yeah, and so um, that's super interesting to think through a little bit because um, I think we're in in conversations that we've had as as you've been installing and we've been experiencing, you know, the exhibition in space. I think ostensibly from the outset, this project was very much about IBM and its history, but that was really a jumping off point. And once you're in the space, it actually becomes very much about something else. And so I think, you know, one thing um, that I learned from you in the research process about this particular project was, again, looking at this, you know, time period when um, IBM and, and many other companies, you know, in the, in the mid 20th century were shifting from manufacturing, let's say, to more services oriented um, business strategies, their architecture really informed that shift or, or it was articulated through their architecture. Right. So you said how you've talked about how Saarinen in the IBM Rochester building was really intent on building a space that emphasized, let's say, principles of modularity, flexibility, um, a more lateral uh, structure as opposed to a top down structure. And so that, I think, has made me really attuned to architecture and, and the architecture here at the museum and how that also informs you know, our bodies in space. And that I think is what you know. You were just saying it's become much more about that. Um, so when you're in the space and you see the blue light reflected onto different um, parts of the interior architecture, you become much more aware, and your senses are much more keenly attuned to the spaces, you know, the physical architecture that surrounds us. But can you also talk about the environmental aspects that you were just saying and, and the perception? Um, 
just tease that out a bit more yeah. for us. So just before I do that, and, and, and kind of a follow up to what you're saying. So similarly to the logic of the facade, the same thing is happening in the exhibition space with the decision to actually recreate this kind of ghost of an auditorium, because precisely in the original IBM building, uh, it was one of the first factories where so-called blue collar and so-called white collar workers were working side by side. You had laboratories and manufacturing facilities, but the only place that where the kind of workers would meet was kind of this building in the middle where there was a cafeteria and an auditorium. And the idea was that, you know, kind of these, the, the concept of coming together, you know, as a group working kind of in one, in one company and kind of talking about things, thinking about the company also as a forum. So that transformation, right, with the labor force also came with an ideal understanding of concepts of coming together and sharing. Uh, and so it was important that that would also be brought up, brought back, sorry, that that architectonic uh, principle would also be brought back and see how we, you know, where we stand uh, now with it. To, to kind of answer your question, and that was really a, um, an unexpected uh, part of this project is, you know, this, also, this project was uh, fully kind of executed during uh, uh, COVID. So uh, it was m installed mostly in my absence. And there were already like, it, it had to work, you know, the ideas worked in paper, but it was very hard to simulate them because, you know, you can do all the renderings you want. You can never really understand how it would be to be in that space. And so I was really kind of moved and I'm still kind of processing because I've only been here for a few days of how much, you know, the project um, uh, certainly is rooted in uh, very specific histories, but ultimately kind of takes this turn into um, kind of a, 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 a slight alteration of the way you look at the world. And so what I'm, I've been saying to myself in the past few days is that for sure there's something happening in the lounge and something happening in the gallery and a story that's being told. But ultimately it's also like how you exit the, you know, then you kind of leave this lounge and either go through the rest of the museum or go out into the world and suddenly everything is slightly more orange or the greens are a little more intense. And so it's kind of about that moment of like recognizing that experience is also, you know, far beyond, um, uh, you know, cognitive understanding of facts. You know, that there's something that happens in the exhibition space that maybe stays with you you know, a second, a minute, an hour, a day later, which is, uh, uh, that for me was a, was a, 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 a really interesting, ultimately accident, uh, but a really transformative part of the project um, that I'm still trying to kind of come, come to terms with. Because I think I can understand the project analytically, right? And I can understand and explain the project formally but there's something um, in the in the um, uh, enactment of this work in this particular place, in this particular moment in time, also, right? Uh, that ultimately this project is is not a, just a romantic reflection on mid-century modern design. It's actually understanding that we are in a part of a continuum of that moment. That the way in which we relate to our workplace and in which in, the way in which we relate even to the furniture that we choose in our surrounding is actually a direct extension of that moment and that it's kind of like borrowing from the past in the present for the future that i am like I, th this project is caught in that moment yeah, definitely. And and talking about, you know, this moment, I mean, as you've said, you know, much of your practice looks at the past to understand perhaps the present and where we may be going um, in the future. And in this, you know, particular year during the pandemic, um, as you said, you know, you weren't able to be here, you know, to do more site visits or to install specifically in the gallery until this past week. Um, how has the installation changed for you? I mean, as you've walked through it, given the pandemic in this past year, I mean, I think it's taken on a, a very, I think it's, you hit on something as you were 
conceiving of it, but I think it's taken on a different tenor given the fact that, you know, office spaces and many spaces have been emptied out during the pandemic. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is interesting to see that, yeah, the, the, the trigger of, you know, this project was triggered uh, with an investigation of an office building that was basically being emptied. And it was being emptied for reasons unrelated to COVID, but it becomes in a way, it became a foreshadowing mechanism, right? It, it became a place of reflection on a certain type of landscape that we might soon be surrounded by. And what do we do with these kind of spaces that are evacuated of people and might actually, rather than mourn them, they might actually um, uh, contain within them these incredibly um, uh, maybe transformative uh, uh, components, right? But it's just about like, how do you go on looking? How do you go about looking for them? And it's also important to note that originally the show was supposed to open in November 2020 and run through the winter. And the original title of the show was Winter Blues. And it was kind of this kind of in understanding of relationship also with the with the kind of the Minnesota and winters and actually the space offering a play almost like a light therapy for the kind of museum goers and then it's interesting how like when you shift the season now this is kind of a summer show and it starts kind of offering uh, a, a maybe a place of like repose and coolness but in the in light of what has happened the past year maybe it's also a place of reflection so i, I maybe i had not um uh, I had not expected the maybe almost uh, contemplative component of uh, of the installation, that it maybe uh, provides a moment of rest, a moment of reflection, a moment of repose, as opposed to kind of a, a more like active uh, um, uh, in, in installation. Uh, but in a way, that's always been a, a very interesting uh, component of the way I look at the world you know like it there's the I, I kind of I always say that I have like I, I go through you know places and I can already see them hollow you know partly because I'm trained because I, I'm trained as an architect, so I know how something is built, but also partly because of my personal experience, where I come from, and the, the, the way I was introduced to urban environments that were either in the process of being destroyed or being rebuilt. So for me, kind of a building that's kind of fully functioning is the least interesting part in a building's history. So it's actually the moment like before it comes together and in the moment after a certain collapse. And that's kind of reflected, I would say, very um, uh, strongly in most of the work. Uh, this idea of fragmentation, this idea of kind of this kind of ghosts that that are carried through these disembodied forms. Right. And this idea of ruins as is something that you've referenced before. Yeah, but not like romantic ruins, right. you know, like kind of these these um, yeah, I don't know what the other option would be. Yeah, but. I mean, just as you said, destruction, you know, and then the coming back together and reimagining of parts that may have been disseminated and pulled together again. Um, you know, you you talked about uh, this, how the pandemic may have accentuated uh, things that you were thinking about when you initially conceived of the exhibition. And in particular, you know, uh, we've talked about um, the move from office labor, specifically to very digital forms of, of labor. Um, and all of us are very familiar with, you know, being on Zoom all day long um, and working in a different way. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm curious to, to know, well, I guess the question is, um, there's something quite unsettling in, mm. in the exhibition as well. I mean, it's, it's hitting on this, this transition but there's something in unsettling in the exhibition you've talked about, you know, these chair parts that you've hung um, that are all suspended from the ceiling. So they're not quite grounded. They're there, but not there. Um, but then there's also your voice, you know, the audio component that we haven't talked about at all. 
um, which is also very unsettling. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the making of that? Sure. And that, in a way, the audio component. So in a way, if we had opened the show when we originally planned to, it would have all the elements that you can see except the audio. And I think like this kind of extension, this moment of pause that the, the pandemic and the events of the last year have given me were kind of I think there was a moment where uh, you, William, and I were talking about, you know, um, it's not that the work was missing something, but that there was something unsettling, it, that it felt kind of settled, you know, and that there was a moment where maybe it needed to kind of start being unsettled. And so throughout my research, I, you know, I had kind of come across the fact that IBM is now investing primarily in artificial intelligence and particularly in text to speech and speech to text chatbots. And there was all this research about the kind of human experience with chatbots and how we kind of relate more to accented voices as opposed to people who speak for perfect English and kind of all this research in kind of artificial intelligence and and kind of robotics. And I was really, you know, similarly to borrowing elements and kind of reimagining them, uh, I was interested in maybe borrowing that idea of the text-to-speech chatbot and uh, kind of making a voice that sounds like me, which is ultimately what the, the, the audio piece ended up being. So I trained this, um, uh, this AI uh, to, um, to sound like me, and it, it kind of reads a very a script, right? So ultimately, it's a very scripted uh, audio work, but kind of the uncanny component is in the kind of um, moment where you kind of you suspend your disbelief and the voice hovers uh, ever so slightly between like a very human experience and a completely uh, mechanized one. And so, um, and, and honestly, when I was training the, you know, the chatbot, I was like, this will never, this will never work. Cause the script that I was sent was like, I think from like planet earth or something. I was like reading about like giraffes and penguins and Antarctica. And I was like, that will, you know, that will never sound like me. And I mean, I'm even unsettled hearing the, the, the audio piece, how much not only it sounds like me, but it picks up on some of the mannerisms and the, the, the inflections of my voice that are very uh, uncanny. And I think it kind of pushes, for sure, the, the voice spews at you a lot of facts. But there's a moment where if you just let go of those facts and you just start like kind of, or at least I kind of start thinking about this kind of, yeah, this the re-emergence of a body, right? Because in a way, the installation is very disembodied, right? The, the subjective is completely evacuated from, from these objects. And in other projects, I reinsert subjectivity through first person narratives. And in this particular project, the idea was to reinsert subjectivity through this AI chatbot. So in a way, the, the body and the self returns, but it actually returns as a transformed being. So even myself is, you know, like usually, like usually I'm the animator of these things, but this is ultimately a test even to my own subjectivity, where as I return to the project, it's not me who returns, but it's not, it's not I, sorry, who returns, but it's this, this, uh, this AI that sits in a way a few centimeters from me. And if you haven't had a chance to go into the gallery yet, um, after hearing Ryan's voice, you will understand just how eerie it is, um, this AI component, because it sounds exactly like Ryan. And I think during the installation, um, he had some fun and would, would weird me out by typing in different scripts that would talk directly to me using his uh, computer automated voice. Um, so I think at this point, we'll uh, open it up to questions. So if you have any questions for Ryan about you know, this particular installation or about his way of working um, in general, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and then we'll run a mic to you. Um, so I see a question up here. Uh, thank you very much for your talk and for the exhibit. Um, I'm curious about 
you're talking about his process, um, whether you're always searching for a kind of a narrative to tie your work, or not to tie your work, but to generate uh, the mise-en-scene. Um, and I'm specifically interested in this one, uh, alternatively, how, whether, what you feel the value is in the originality of the object itself. Now, so you went and actually sourced Eames chairs and Eames chairs parts, but is that intrinsic to what you're doing? Does it have to be that, or could you just go, I've got an idea, I'll just go spin one on a lathe? And how much of um, the atomic structure is important to creating what you do? Yeah, thank, thank you for this. Um, yeah, part of me is very attached to this um, uh, kind of an, an idea that, that kind of um, objects hold objects and material hold subjectivity just like you know just like us and there's something in kind of the question let's say of authenticity that is still very uh, important to me and it's not kind of authenticity of personal experience more so uh, it's more about kind of if an object or a material has witnessed something so think thinking of, of objects and materials as witnesses and in that sense there is an importance in in their physiology right it is important it is very important to me that these are chair parts from that particular factory or at least it's important for me to think that and uh, uh, it's but similarly there's moments where you know uh, it, it was it was important that for for the for the facade transposition that it was not really the actual facade right it's a vinyl transfer of an interpretation of a color so in that sense it's actually really removed from the authentic object right so the 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 vinyl is is just like an interpretation whereas the oh, Whereas the the color spectrum, the piece that you see in the in the in the gallery when you go in, which is kind of this blue light that cycles through these ten shades of blue, it was important to me that it was very precisely the ten exact shades of blue that Paul Rand had set in 1956. So I think I would think I would say that this is actually quite fluid. There are moments where. The, the historiography behind uh, like object histories is is crucial to the success at least in in my eyes of the of the work and in some case it's actually really open for 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 interpretation and I think the same goes with with the stories you know I don't um, even though these the narrative and the object sit side by side sometimes there might be a confusion that you know the story is illustrating uh, sorry that the objects are illustrating the story right or the story is explaining the object but I would imagine we had a conversation last night about it that it's actually kind of storytelling and object making is part of a spectrum and the work actually is a pendulum that goes in between the two it's neither one nor the other uh, there's a moments where you know you don't really need to read any of the text or listen to the audio if you don't want to there's something in that and in some case you can read and not even enter the room you can you know there's there's like I think there's in my opinion, uh, there's shared components for object making and storytelling, which is the potential for um, challenging the imagination. I, personally, like I think that that kind of uh, uh, writing and making are part of the same way of of kind of creating and imagining. And there's a question back there. Hi, thank you so much. I, I love the exhibit and, and just hearing you speak and expound more upon this is, is really, really illuminating. When I was visiting it this morning, I was reminded of a piece by Robert Irwin that I think was in that very uh, space in um, 2009 and I know earlier too. And that you know may be incidental, but I'm just curious if you could speak more about um, if there are any other inspirations or other points of reference more artistic in nature here. I mean, there's a, a, a like a a beta version of this show, which is or like, if I were to do the show again, I would do a collection show, and I would pull all the works in the Walker's collection that have the color blue in it, 
and it would just be this kind of like crazy like presentation um i so in part of the the research for this project i do i dove deeply into the the walker's collection and particularly uh, i mean the Irwin is definitely a big one i mean we're sitting very close to um the james terrell uh, piece um there's also like a, a very important historical uh, and contentious painting the uh, the blue riders the the horses which is in the collection of, of the walker that at some point was going to make an appearance in this show uh, so I've, I've, I'm, I was very much aware of the uh, th those legacies, uh, but it, it's very interesting that when the show was set up, because I couldn't in a way mock it up, I knew that it would kind of have those references, maybe intrinsically, but I didn't know the extent to which it would pull from these references. And when, you know, the first day when I came into the space, because I thought originally that the back wall would really act like a screen, right? Like it was kind of, I was building this kind of ghost cinema and that kind of these chairs were like looking at a, at a screen. Or if it wouldn't be that, maybe it would be a theater, right? And it would be, look more like a stage. But by virtue of kind of the, the position of the light, uh, the, the kind of the distance from the war, they ended up creating kind of this haze, you know, this kind of space where it's, it's actually much more in a way physical than I had originally kind of intended it. So it's interesting to think of those references as kind of art historical references. And then it's interesting to think of them as experiential references. And so it's, I think the, the I'm kind of caught in, in this in-between moment because it's, uh, and, and, and it's important, you know, I, I always say like I am, you know, I did my entire studies in, in the US, like my undergrad and my grad studies. So in a way I'm very much a, I was trained in kind of a legacy of kind of minimal conceptual, post-conceptual art. But ultimately I come, you know, from a, from a village in Lebanon and the legacy of like the stories of my parents and my grandparents is as kind of transformative, as important as my training. And I always say I'm kind of like this like weird love child of like my grandma and like Richard Serra, you know, kind of like these moments where like, I mean, at some, well, the first, I mean, the bet, I'll just give it like a quick example. Like I went to, you know, I'm like in my 20s, I go to like MoMA for the first time in New York and I see this kind of lead piece, uh, like Richard Serra's like molten lead on the floor. And I was like, oh shit, like my grandma used to like melt lead and drop it in, you know, in a cup of water above my head because she thought I was cursed. And I was just like, it's the same thing, right? It's the same process, you melt lead and then you throw it somewhere. And one is supposed to be this champion of modernism, right? And kind of conceptual art. And the other is just, you know, my grandma that can barely uh, read or write. And then, and, and, I'm, and I'm caught in that moment, right? And that's it kind of in a way going back to the previous question. That's why material, I'm so attached to materials because if ultimately you go, you go to the roots of that anecdote, you know, lead, ultimately it's the same lead, right? It's just the material. It's in its inaction and interpretation and how it kind of echoes in those different contexts that then it moves far beyond itself. Um, beautifully said. And also to when Ryan was saying that he actually went through the Walker's collection to find works that you know had the color blue or resonated with blue in some way, he's not kidding. He has a huge file of I'm all doing of the show one day. <laughs> All of the works. Um, do we have one, any one or two final questions before we wrap up? And maybe bef I'll give people a little bit of time for that um, last question. And the one thing I wanted to ask you is, and I know we've had some conversations about this, um, is seeing the installation, and you did touch on this a little bit, but seeing the installation in person and walking through it was there anything in particular that was a real surprise to you from, you know, what you imagined and envisioned and what we could render, you know, virtually and digitally? But is there anything in this last day or two as you've been, you know, walking through and, and seeing people experience the exhibition that has been of a particular surprise? Yeah, I don't know. I'm like still kind of processing this. Part of me just wants to like sit in that lounge like 
for a few months and then just see the the I mean I didn't I I it's interesting I understood the components, right? It's kind of this weird thing. It's as if you understand the ingredients, but you don't know what the dish will taste like. And and it's and it, it sounds really esoteric, but for me it's that was maybe the most surprising element that in a way because I was so caught in the historiography and the research, there's I had forgotten along the way that this project started with an anecdote that it was actually quite intuitive, that there was something, you know, actually very um, much about kind of sensations that was at the core of the project. And maybe that was, that is very surprising because I'm kind of reminded of a, of my past self, right? Like I'm reminded of an earlier moment in this process where it was, it was and still is quite magical. Um, and, and the other kind of interesting kind of dichotomy is to really think of the two surfaces. So the surface of the curtain wall in relationship to the surface of the projection in, in the gallery and to really think of them as these mirror mirrors of each other. So one, which is the, the curtain wall is something that you, you know, you set it in motion. It's quite a simple principle, but then it will never be the same. You know, the, the lounge is ever changing because it's reacting to the, you know, daylight and the weather and what's going on. And in, oppos in complete opposition, you have this, this wall in, in the gallery that's so finely tuned where we know that every five minutes, the same exact thing will happen. And so to think of these two kind of conditions that are uh, so kind of, um, that, that, yeah, act, I think, as anchors of this project. That was, you know, a big surprise to me to start reimagining this as one work because I had spent so much time thinking about the particularities of the elements, but the way kind of it, it comes back together is, yeah. Is there any final question or should we get you all out of the heat? There's one final question back there. So you kind of talked about getting caught up in the research specifically and then realizing that it was more intuitive. And as, um, and you know, studying art history myself and also being a practicing artist, I feel like those two are really challenging. So doing all the research, exploring all these different artists and like, am I doing the right thing? Can you talk a little bit about finding a balance like that and specifically with this project? You know, like where do you draw the line with research versus just doing it and creating, like in the words of Sully Witt, just do it when he was writing towards Ava Hess. Like I think of that as a reminder for myself quite often, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I always, you know, think that, you know, even though the work might be misunderstood as like uh, the practice might be misunderstood as like, like research-based practice, I always like to remind myself that the triggers for a lot of these journeys are, let's say, anecdotes or accidental encounters or a random article on Wikipedia that I cannot fact check, you know? So I'm like, it's, it's actually like I'm, and to, to be reminded of that, right? I, I constantly, whenever I feel like I'm overwhelmed with material, I have to like remind myself that like what in this um, research triggers imagination or triggers, for lack of a better word, magic. And even in kind of editing, you know, like the script was, a, 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 it was much more, you know, I mean, it's still very factual. It's much, it was much more um, a script that you could read. And then when I started hearing it in the space, I started kind of like cutting chunks out of it. And that editing process, I would say, came about uh, realizing that there's maybe certain stories that wouldn't echo correctly in the space, that there's certain stories that maybe uh, create or open up your imagination when you read them, but they don't do the same thing when you hear them. And so I think, I, I, you know, that's very specific for the script, but I would say the same also for object making, you know, for like kind of there's a moment where the editing process is so essential because what you leave behind is, is yeah, is as like important as what you end up kind of showing. And, and I think that the, the, 
it, it's, it's very difficult. It's very challenging because you kind of get invested in this material. But I always say like, you know, that's why I have like always like a notebook and I write down these notes because ultimately these elements can find their way back into your work like years from now. You know, I kind of, it's, 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 it's not, you know, when you edit something out, it's not that it's gone forever. You know, there's a way where it might come back up in a different form, in a different project, in a different context. Right. And just to quickly follow up on that in, in the context of this project, you know, I think what was so interesting is that you did so much research and you went down these rabbit holes and, you know, I would have a conversation with Ryan and then he wouldn't um, reappear until, you know, a few days later. And during that time you had gone in, you know, so many different um, directions around a you know particular idea that you had but there's so much that as you said didn't actually make it into the final installation and that's so interesting because it's something that you know there are these stories that you know and that were important to you but ultimately you've realized formally it didn't make sense or for you know for the visitor didn't need to know the, the entire context to in experience the installation yeah, and I would say in a way, like a lot of the, the research that I do is material that's also readily available. And so I think for me, it's like the, it's an, it, it, the work is ultimately not the end result, right? It's an invitation for a further journey. So ultimately, a lot of these kind of anecdotes and stories, if you just start kind of like, just Google like IBM Rochester and go to the Wikipedia page. And then if you just follow these hyperlinks, suddenly you'll be in like a, a crazy whirlwind. And I think that's that for me is, is you know, is so essential because I should also not con claim to control those narratives, right? That those narratives arrive to me fragmentary and they will also leave me in the same fragmentary uh, uh, moment. It's just that in that process, I've just like reorganized some of those fragments, uh, as opposed to claiming that I'm bringing back together a sense of wholeness or entirety. And that's, that's a, an important distinction. I think in editing, it helps a lot, because then there's, there's always a moment where you kind of, you have an impulse to bring things together to reappear as whole, that you have to have the whole story, the entire argument, every single detail. But ultimately, I have to remember that it's actually the fragment that triggered the journey. It's not the entire story. Um, and it's something familiar that became unfamiliar along the way that kind of opened up my, my, my mind. Great. So I think that's a beautiful way to end the work as proposition, as an invitation. And so we invite all of you to go into the galleries and see the show. And Ryan and I will um, head in there shortly. But I just want to thank you, Ryan, for coming here and being here um, and doing this talk today. And thanks to all of you again for um, braving the summer heat and sunshine um, and coming out. Thank you. Thank you all.